talking, the um, Air Combat Command General doesn't know what he's talking about, but what is this? It's not a made-up video, okay? Now, here's a question that I have. Is this the tic-tac-toe video? Now, the Skunk Works has a history of producing aircraft that were unheard of until they are. Uh, the U-2, for instance. The U-2 flew over the Soviet Union and China and took pictures of their military facilities. Now you think, well, how could the U-2 have just flown over Russia and China without them intercepting them? Because it flew so high, the Russians and the Chinese did not have aircraft that could fly that high. There's nothing they could do about it. They couldn't intercept the aircraft. They couldn't get there. They couldn't shoot anything at them. In fact, the only time that the Russians ever figured out what the U-2 was was when Gary Powers crashed one, okay? And that wasn't because it was shot down. It was because he just crashed it, okay? I think it was a, I want to say it was a uh, uh, some type of mechanical glitch. But then the SR-71 Blackbird, the fastest ship to ever, ever be invented. We don't have a, a ship that goes that fast now. And this is almost 60-year-old technology. The F-117 Nighthawk, the first stealth fighter. In other words, this place can go, and it can go anywhere it wanted, at least back in the day. And if you flew it at night, you couldn't physically see it, and radar didn't pick it up. These were unheard of technologies until they were. Now, the Skunk Works are or at least were under Kelly Johnson and Ben Rich, a top-down dictatorship that uh, they just got things done, okay? They got things done. Now, as you folks know, I'm not a huge conspiracy theorist like I used to be, okay? Uh, do I still do I trust the government? No, I don't. Do they lie all the time? Yeah, but I'm not quite so sure they're lying about this. They really maybe don't know what the Tic Tac UFOs are. If the Tic Tac UFOs are something out of the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works and the results aren't released because the results historically haven't been released to anybody until they're done. I think, folks, that the Tic Tac UFOs may well be the new secret weapon by the U.S. government coming out of Lockheed Martin skunk works and actually we can hope we can we can really hope that they are because they are for real and if they're not that means that those tic tac ufos if they're not ours if they're not from the skunk works and if the government's telling the truth that means they're either an enemies or they're from another world either which way we don't want because we cannot defend against them interesting and as I've said many times, we certainly live in interesting times. Number two uh, of the Twin Spin podcast essay for today. Uh, I've said for many years, look, folks, see the aging rockers before they die. And the trophy wife and I have done a pretty good job of doing this. Uh, we've seen countless old rockers uh, quite, quite often at the Fox uh, wonderful venue, small venue. You can get up close and personal to them. Perfect acoustics and um, for old people, a nice comfy chair, <laughs> okay? Uh, which means a lot to uh, somebody as they get older. Um, since the pandemic, we've backed off uh, because those that are still touring um, are in crowded venues. And even though we're vaccinated, yeah, we're a little hesitant to do that kind of stuff. But we, were, we considered going to the Rolling Stones concert it was actually last Sunday. Um, the trophy wife said, look, I can get tickets for this. Do you want to go? Well, we had had a busy week. We had had a busy weekend. We were going to have an extremely busy Sunday. And then that was a Sunday night for the concert, which meant we we're already going to be worn out. Then we have to come home. And then we have to get up in the morning for work. So we passed. Am I am I sad that we passed? Mm, maybe. Maybe. Um, you can't use the excuse, well, maybe we'll see him next time around <laughs> because Charlie Watts is dead and the other ones uh, are in their upper 70s, mid to upper 70s. So the next time around, there may not be a next time around, but you know what? That's the thing. But one of the guys that we saw not too long ago, a couple, couple three years ago, that we really enjoyed was Steve Winwood. And until I 
got the tickets, till we got the tickets to see Steve Winwood, I, I, I always liked him a lot, okay? And he's certainly one of the quintessential rockers that, that, that you need to see before, uh, before they retire or pass on. I had no idea that this guy was what he was. I mean, he was born in 1948, which puts him at, uh, what, 73, okay? And you think, 73? Wow, he's been around longer than the Rolling Stones, and the Rolling Stones are all more than 73 years old. How do you figure? Well, first of all, you got to remember who Steve Winwood is and his genre. His genre is basically everything. Blue-eyed soul, rhythm and blues, blues rock, pop rock, uh, all that. Uh, okay, primarily he's a vocalist. Primarily he's a keyboard player, but he also plays many instruments proficiently. Drums, mandolin, guitars, bass, saxophone, uh, you name it, he plays it. Now, he was a key member of several major acts in the 60s and 70s, along with the solo act, uh, the Spencer Davis Group, Traffic, and Blind Faith, to name three. Yeah, those were Steve Winwood groups, all of them. Uh, and Tra- or Spencer Davis Group, he also played with uh, D. Murray and uh, Nigel Olson of, uh, of Elton John fame. But beginning in the 1980s, that's when his solo career took off. He had a number, a number of one, a number one singles like uh, "While You See a Chance" that was in 1980, uh, "Valerie" in 1982, his 1986 album "Back in the High Life" marked uh, his career zenith. He had uh, hit singles including "Back in the High Life Again" and "The Finer Things," and the number one hit "Higher Love," which may be his uh, his best known song. Winward found the top of the Hot 100 again with Roll With It in 1988. That was from the same album. And Holding On charted highly that same year. Now, while the singles ceased to uh, to, to, to really chart uh, at the end of the 1980s, he continued to re- release new albums until actually through 2008. Now, since 2008, he's not released any new music but or any new albums, but he continues to tour alongside classic rock acts, most recently in 2020 with Steely Dan. Now, he was introduced to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of Traffic in 2004. In 2005, he was honored as a BMI icon at the annual BMI London Awards for his enduring influence on generations of music makers. 2008 Rolling Stone ranked Steve Winwood number 33 of the 100 greatest singers of all times. 33, that's up there. He also won two Grammy Awards. He's been nominated for a Brit Award for Best Male Artist. Uh, He's won the Ivor Novello Award, the British Academy of Songwriters and Composers and Authors Award for Outstanding Song Collection, and on and on and on. Um, Now, Steve Winwood was, not unlike Elton John, a child prodigy. Born in 1948, his father was a semi-professional musician who mainly played saxophone and clarinet. When did Steve Winwood begin playing the piano? He was four, (laughs) okay? Uh, He liked swing and Dixieland music, okay? Then after the piano, again, at age four, he started playing the drums and guitar. And he was a choir boy at St. John's Church of England. Uh, Winwood attended the Great Bar School, which was one of the first, what they call in the UK, comprehensive schools. We call them magnet schools over here, kind of where they specialize on the arts or something different. Okay, So his parents obviously realized this and enrolled him in this type of school. He also attended the Birmingham and Midlands Institute of Music to help develop skills as a pianist. At eight years old, eight years old, mind you, He first performed with his father and his elder brother, Muff, in the Roy Atkinson Band at age eight. Now, Muff, his older brother, uh, later recalled that Steve began playing regularly with them in licensed pubs and clubs, and they turned the piano around so that Winwood had his backs to to the audience to try to hide him because he was eight. (laughs) He was obviously underage for playing in a pub. So at age eight, he was playing in pubs for money, okay? Uh, while he was still a uh, pupil at the Grand Bar School, that's that magnet school, Winward was part of the Birmingham blues rock scene, playing the Hammond Three organ, guitar, backing blues and rock legends, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, Howling Wolf, B.B. King, Chuck Berry, and Bo Diddley on the United Kingdom tours. Now, back then, 
it was the custom at the time when U.S. singers would come over to the U.K. to tour, they came by themselves, uh, and they just got pickup bands, okay? I guess the travel, the expense, it was cheaper. People come to see the star, not the band, okay? So Steve Winwood played for these guys while he was still in school, in grade school. He played for Muddy Water, John Lee Hooker, B.B. King, Chuck Berry, and Bo Diddley. It's amazing. Uh, now, Winwood was living on Atlantic Road uh, in that great bar area where he went to school, and he was real close to the uh, to the bar scene, to the music scene. That's why he played in all the bars. When did he join the Spencer Davis group? That was his first popular group that he was in. Age 14. That's right. At 14, Steve Winwood joined the Spencer Davis group with his older brother, Muff, um, and he was the singer for the band and the main songwriter for the band at 14. Okay. Now the group made their debut at the Eagle and subsequently had a Monday night residency at the Eagle when he was 14. Now in 1964, the Spencer Davis group signed their first recording contract with Island records. Now the founder of Island records, Chris Blackwell later said of Winwood, quote, he was really the cornerstone of Island records. He's a musical genius. And because he was with Island, all the other talent really wanted to be with Island as well. Now, their first single, Spencer Davis Group's first single, uh, was recorded 10 days after Winwood's 16th birthday. The number one single, Keep On Running. The money from that Winwood made, he was then able to buy his own Hammond organ. So yeah, he was playing on a borrowed organ because he was only 16 years old. Now, the big uh, Spencer Davis group, Give Me give me Some Lovin' and I'm a Man. Yeah, Rin, Winwood wrote those. He co-wrote them anyway. Uh, but then he had enough, and he, uh, he left the Spencer Davis group after those hits in 67. So who did he go with at age 19 now? Uh, how about Eric Clapton? Okay, Eric Clapton and the Powerhouse. That was the band, and Winwood joined it. Uh <coughs> At that time, Winwood meant glum, uh, drummer John Capaldi, guitarist Dave Mason. Yeah, that Dave Mason. And uh, multi-instrumentalist Chris Wood. They jammed together at the Elbow Room in Birmingham. And after Wood left the Spencer Davis group, those four people founded the group Traffic. So in 1967, at age 19, Steve Winwood was already in his third group. <laughs> Spencer Davis group. Uh, Eric Clapton, the powerhouse, and now traffic. Now, soon thereafter, uh, the group rented a cottage near the rural village of Ashton Triffold in Berkshire, uh, and they wrote and rehearsed music there. This allowed them to escape the city and develop their music without interruption. Now, early in traffic's formation, Winwood and Capaldi formed a songwriting partnership. Winwood wrote the music, Capaldi wrote the lyrics. This partnership was the source of most of Traffic's material, including the popular songs Paper Sun and The Low Spark of the High Heeled Boys. And uh, they actually, that, the partnership actually outlived the band. In fact, uh, they produced several songs for Winwood and Capaldi's solo albums. Now, over the band's history, Winwood performed the majority of their lead vocals, the keyboard vocals, or the keyboard instruments, I should say, and guitars. He also frequently played bass and percussion up to and including the recording sessions of their fourth, out, fourth album. Now, while still in traffic, Winwood was brought in by Jimi Hendrix to play the organ on Voodoo Chili and Electric on the Electric Ladyland album. Tiring with Triumph from Traffic, Winwood then joined the supergroup Blind Faith in 1969. He's now 21. Eric Clapton, Ginger Baker, Rick Creech, and, of course, Steve Winwood formed Blind Faith. Now, the band was short-lived because Clapton left the band at the end of the tour. However, Baker, Winwood, and Gretsch stayed together to form Ginger Baker's Air Force, another super band. Now, the, the lineup consisted of three quarters of Blind Faith, no Clapton, and who was replaced by Denny Lane. Yeah, that Denny Lane of Paul McCartney and Wings fame. Half of Traffic also, that's Winwood and Chris Wood, and Minus Capaldi and Dave Mason. And there were other uh, 
musicians who, uh, who interacted with Baker in his early days as well. Now, this project turned out to be short-lived as well. Baker soon went in the studio and began.